And so we begin this study on uh, Wednesdays called Experiencing God. And I hope that you'll be a part of it. Because when you come to experience, to know and do the will of God in your life, it's one of the most tremendous things that you will ever, ever experience. And so on Sunday mornings, I want to talk to you over these next several weeks about that experience of God. And, and how do we get from point A to point B in this experience? And today, uh, if, if I have to put a, a title to it, I, I would simply call it In These Steps, found in the, in the book of Jude, Jude verses 20 and 21. Now, Jude's not a long uh, book, you know, doesn't have but the one chapter. So verses 20 and 21, it's over there at the end of the Bible, right before you get to Revelation, Jude 20 and 21. And so, you know, Jesus had something to say to us on the night before his crucifixion, the Lord Jesus Christ said these words. He said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. 
And then Jude repeats these words in verse 21. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. And then he shows us how to do it. How do I keep myself in the love of God? How do I keep myself pursuing God? How do I keep myself in that venue, in that area, in my life? And on the island of Patmos, we come across John, the apostle. And he's in exile there. And the Lord Jesus reveals himself to to John. And John records the words. And in chapter 3, he records these words as Jesus speaks, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And somehow or another, I I feel as if that word speaks to so many of us. Maybe we just feel totally cold towards Christ and His love. Or maybe there's some of us that are really hot, but I would venture to say that many of us are lukewarm and don't even know it. On Friday night, we had a a ball game over in Fort Walton. As y'all know, Elena uh, plays soccer for the Fort Walton Beach Vikings, and it was a cold game. And so Beverly and I dropped her at the field uh, because she had to be there an hour early, so we had other things to do. And, And one of those other things to do was to stop at Starbucks and Beverly got a hot chocolate, and I got a hot cup of coffee, and it was hot. You know, it it survived the ride from Starbucks back to the field and to the stands, and it was still hot. You know, you had to be easy in drinking it. So it lasted me, you know, through most of the first half, and, and, and at the halftime, I went to get a refill on coffee. So I just thought I'll use my Starbucks cup and hand it to them and let them do it. And, um, and sure enough, you know, they filled it up. I paid them the dollar. And I get back up to the stands and I set my, my cup down because my star daughter's running down the field. I'm going to snap a picture. She wouldn't stop for me to get the, the picture made. But I pick up the cup and go drink it. Now, it hasn't been three minutes and I drink it. It's totally lukewarm. It's not even worth drinking. I, I just want to go, you know. It's no good. And and here was something served to me that they did not realize to be lukewarm. Wow. Isn't that something? Do you ever think that possibly we might offer to God something that is lukewarm and we don't even know it? Do you ever think that possibly our love for God could be lukewarm and and we, we fail to recognize it? Do you think that our service could be lukewarm and and, and we fail to identify it? And, And the Bible goes on a little further. Jesus is still speaking in this chapter. He says, those whom I love, those whom I love, I reprove and and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And, and, and so the Lord's talking to us. He's talking to his church. He's saying, I'm standing there at the door and I'm knocking. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and, and, and dine with you. Do you realize that when we sit down and have a meal with someone, it's the most intimate fellowship that we can have? That we're sitting down and we're sharing. And this is what Jesus is saying, is that he will come in and sit down with us and share with us right where we are. And we have to go no further. And so the church, what I find when I look at the church is, is the church is made up of individuals, right? I mean, there's a lot of us as individuals that are here even in this church this morning. And what I find among us as individuals is we're frail creatures of dust. Have you ever notice that? We're as feeble as we are frail. Like when I see a video that they've shot of me advertising experiencing God, I'm thinking, who's this guy? How did he get to be that old? Do you ever look in the mirror and ask that question, how did I get to be this old? You know, time flies by. And the Bible tells us that we are those frail creatures of dust and, and, and that, that uh, time is flying by on us. And, and not only are we those frail creatures of dust, but we deal with this entire range of emotions. 
And we deal with trials and challenges and and weaknesses and, and strengths. And sometimes in the battle, we don't win. We don't win. We give it everything we've got, but, but we don't always win. Yesterday, Chris and I, my son, were out playing golf. I had him nervous on the first seven holes. I was in the lead. Amen? Come on, help me out here. That's pretty good. But I didn't win at the 18th. We don't always win. How do we deal with it when, when we're not always winning? As a matter of fact, failure so often overtakes us. Or at least it's nipping at our heels. There's times in, in a moment of humility that we see our reflection and we recognize that, that we're not winning. But so often we're moving on in our foolish pride and we just keep going and going even though we're on a losing path. And some of us are like the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son? He left home. But when he left the home, it didn't mean that his father stopped loving him. When he went and sold sold his oats in a foreign country, the father loved him no less. When he found himself spent out and eating the hog slop with the other hogs, the father still loved him. And when the father looked down that dusty road on that particular day and he saw the figure of that son coming home, he loved him no more and he loved him no less. He loved that boy. But that young man was unaware of that father's love. And you know, we are sometimes like that prodigal. We're doing it our way. We're doing our thing. We're making our choices. And as I was thinking about that this week and putting these thoughts together, a song came across my mind somehow. It's, it came out of my childhood, but then I, I think I listened to it. was maybe the David Crowder band that, that did it on YouTube. It's called Come Thou Fount. The old song says, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, but... The Crowder version is, you know, come thou fount, come thou king. But these words found within the chorus of that song so speak to who we are. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. And you know, how many of us have have been in the presence of Almighty God and and we've had that that time where we have sensed His, His Spirit upon us. There's a holiness encircling us. Perhaps even there's been a holiness that has filled us. And His Spirit is like a fire burning within our bones. And and we, like the disciples who went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, say, Lord, it's good that we're here. Let's build a a temple for this and a temple for that. We're not going to leave. But somewhere along the way, we wander. We've got this tendency. We are prone to to wander. We're prone to leave the the God I love, the the God that we made that proclamation to. I love you and I, I cherish you and I'll follow you all the days of my life. And we have that tendency to move away. But our prayer is, Lord, here's my heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy throne above. And so in that wandering and in that leaving, we find ourselves sometimes captivated and captured in sin. And we think, well, God, I I, want to come back, but, you know, what I've been doing is just too bad. It's too horrible. I'm too ashamed. But let me tell you this. There is absolutely no sin in our life that catches God by surprise. And He's still standing on that porch, metaphorically. 
And he's still loving us just as much when we're prone to wander, when we're prone to leave. And he's loving us no less when we turn and we say, God, here's my heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy throne above. And so, his love never fails. And his love never gives up on you and on me. And so Jude pens these words that we come to today in this short little book in verse 20 and verse 21. And this is what he says, but you... He's talking to you, he's talking to me, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Now, now Jude is talking about us. Somewhere within the heart of mankind is this desire. A desire to know God, a desire to love God, a desire to reflect God rather than just reflecting ourselves and reflecting Hollywood and reflecting our culture. And there are three important words that Jude gives us here that that lead into what our topic uh, is about today. He says that we are to build, we're to build ourselves up. We're to pray in the Holy Spirit, and we're to wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. We're to build, we're to pray, we're to wait. And what these words speak to is they speak to our abiding. Abide. What does abiding mean? Well, when you look it up, this is what abiding means. It means to wait for. To wait for. You know, we're not accustomed to waiting for anything. We want it instantaneously to wait for. And and, and it be used in the sense, I will abide, I will wait for the coming of the Lord. That's what it means to abide. That's That's what Jude said, that we're waiting for the coming of the Lord. It means to accept without objection. I will abide in your decision. I will live by your decision. It means to remain stable or fixed. Uh, in a state. In other words, to continue in a place, I will abide, I will stay in the house of the Lord. And so when Jude talks to us about building and praying and waiting, he's not giving us three secrets, but he's giving us three steps. He's given us three principles that we might come to know and do the will of God, that we might come to experience God in our everyday life. And so I'm going to describe these things with three easy statements that you can remember. Number one, we're going to look in. Number two, we're going to look up. And number three, we're going to look forward. So what's number one? Number two? There you go. I told you you could remember that. I knew you could remember that. So in order to elevate your life, The very first thing that has to happen if I'm going to experience God is I've got to look in. He says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. You know, so oftentimes we're so busy and so focused on the things that are outside of us that we fail to recognize the weaknesses inside of us. And each of us, you know, we've got these hidden faults. We've got these cracked places. We've got these... Messy room, so to speak. And, and we've got these miscalculations and we have these grievances against the Spirit of God. And, and so here we are, we're going through life and, and our, our um, spiritual fervor is not what it used to be. And we know that we've got this proneness to leave the God we love, this proneness to wander. And then we question and say, well, you know, where have I missed the mark? What's gone wrong? And so oftentimes our our hidden faults and our cracks and our messy places have become such a part of us that we're totally accustomed to them and we fail to recognize them anymore. And across the stage of the church, there are those that are involved in Sinful habits. 
and moral compromises and ethical lapses and spiritual accommodations that are rationalized away as being petty or trivial or unimportant. Or we dabble in things that we ought not to to be dabbling in. We think, well, it's really no big deal. And later we discover, often when it's too late, that living out our lives on such fault lines ultimately result in incomprehensible damage to us and to those who are closest to us. And so Jude pins these words and he says, But you, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith. And so we have to look inward. We have to uncover those hidden things in us, that hidden person in us. That's why David prayed and he said, Search me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my faults. It's not that God doesn't already know us, but as God is searching us, what's happening is He's revealing these things to us. As God is searching us, He's he's showing us this crack in our life. He's showing us this messy room in in our life. He's showing us this, this obstacle in our life, this failure in our life. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my my thoughts. And and so the Spirit begins that work of, of probing and uncovering and revealing of our nature. And we begin to agree with God on what His Spirit's evaluation has done in us. You see, weaknesses in our foundation keep us from being built strong. Have you ever noticed that? Weaknesses in our foundation. I mean, there's an entire industry that comes in and jacks up houses who have a weak foundation, who've cracked. And weaknesses in our personal foundation have cracks too. They have to be dealt with. Has those hidden hidden faults. And so our foundation can't be built upon our accomplishments. Our foundation can't be built upon our family lineage. Our, Our foundation can't even be built upon where we're a member of a church. Our foundation's got to be built upon Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For, so, so, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So if your life is not built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, your life is on shifting sand. Your life is upon cracked bricks. Your, your life is not going to, to form out, formulate and come out the way God would like you to come out. You're not going to be all that He's created you to be. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and said, built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. So Christ not only is our foundation, but he is the chief cornerstone upon which everything else is built. That cornerstone is the most important piece of a a structure as it goes up. Because if that cornerstone is out of uh, plumb, if it's out of line, if it's out of measure, if it's out uh, of, of level, the entire building is going to be faulty. That's why when an earthquake happens and it shifts a building's foundation, that those buildings, although they've not collapsed yet, they're deemed uninhabitable because they're going to collapse. And if our life is not built upon Christ Jesus, we are in that very same position. And then Peter goes on and says, And you are like living stones that are being built up as a spiritual house to a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so what we we learn here is our, our, our house has got to be built upon the foundation of Christ. But our building up, what builds the framework of who we are is, is the Word of God. The Scripture tells us 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, do you know what it means to be blessed? How many of you know you're blessed? Y'all are so much better than 9 o'clock. You know, at 9 o'clock, there are some people who didn't even know they were blessed. Listen, you're blessed. And, 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 and the Lord says, blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman. Blessed is the person. You know, you're not hanging out there with a the counselor. You're not taking advice from the wicked. That's what that means. You're not standing in the way of sinners. You're not doing it uh, the way culture tells you to do it. You're not sitting with the scoffers. You're, you're not living as if you have no belief. But you're living with the delight in the law of God, in His Word, in his, and in that law He meditates day and night. That Word is upon your forehead. It's, a, it's upon your tongue. It's in your heart. And, and the Bible will always have first place in the life of a spiritual Christian. Now, there's some people who say, well, I'm spiritual, but I don't really read the Bible, but I do pray. You'll never have an effective prayer life unless you have a Bible life. And one of the things you'll discover in prayer, and I'll get to prayer in just a minute, but when you're really praying, you learn to pray the Word of God and see that Word put to work in your life. And so it's of the utmost importance that we understand that. And, and, and in saying, you know, I'm not minimizing prayer whatsoever. The psalmist said, I bow down in your holy temple and I give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. This same psalmist who said, thy word, you know, uh, is, is, is important, is saying prayer is important too. And get this, this is what God's Word will do, and I don't have the time to go into the ex, uh, exposition of all this, but God's Word is infallible. In other words, Psalm 19 says, the law of the Lord is perfect. You, it doesn't matter how you look at this book. It doesn't matter if you're looking from the back, or if you're looking from the front, or if you're looking from the middle. What the Bible is, is perfect. And, and so the law of the Lord is perfect. And, and it's inerrant. What's the difference between that? Well, the law of the Word is, of, uh, is perfect, it's infallible, and, and, and it's inerrant in the fact that every word of God proves true. Every word of God proves true. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter where you read. These words prove true. His promises prove, prove true, and His prophecies prove true. And it's complete. As a matter of fact, you read in Revelation chapter 22, I warn everyone, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God will take away his, his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. You see, the Bible ends with a warning. It ends with a warning not to take anything away, not to add anything to. And that's a testimony to its completeness. Think about that. So it's infallible, it's inerrant, it's complete, and it's also authoritative. Listen to what Isaiah had to say. Hear, O heavens, and give er ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Who do you know who carries that kind of authority? I mean, just on an earthly level, just on a personal level. Who in your home carries that kind of authority? I do. When dad speaks, I know, they go ask mom. <laughs> but, but in reality, you know, sometimes we come down hard and fast on something, right? And we put our foot down. But here Isaiah is saying, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. It's authoritative. And when God says something, we are to do that, that something. And it's sufficient. Paul wrote to, to Timothy and he said, And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for what? For salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
So this Word of God gives you everything that you need to know to build your life looking in on the cornerstone Jesus Christ, right? And it gives you everything you need to know to build the walls of your life. This Word speaks to you. So you're going to look in. Where are you going to look next? Up. Okay, so for your life to be picked up, you got to look up. And, and Jude wrote and said, but you, beloved, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, prayer is, uh, is another word for the t- word supplication. And, uh, and, and, and that simply means to make a humble entret- entreaty, especially to pray to God. And, and, and so... We are to pray in the Spirit. And, 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 and the very moment that you become a believer, in the very moment that you've put your faith and the trust in that foundation of Christ, you have the ability to pray. To pray in the Spirit, might I even say. Although you'll grow in that. When we trust Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone in our lives, we are given the the privilege of prayer. And all of our prayer is essentially prayer in the Spirit. There are times when we sense and when we know and we're filled and we're overflowing with the Spirit of God. But all prayer is uttered in spirit in a sense. And prayer, as I define it, is a relationship. It's a relationship wherein we humbly communicate. Humbly communicate. Think about that. Where we humbly communicate and worship and sincerely seek God's face, knowing that He hears us and that He will respond, though not always in a manner that we may expect or devise. Now, Buddy used to sing this song, Sometimes I Thank God, for unanswered prayers. No, Buddy never used to sing that, I don't think. That's a a country song from Nashville. And, you know, you kind of think about that. How many of you have prayed for something that you look back on now and it was kind of stupid? Thanks, Mark. You and I are the only ones. But really, how many of us can thank God for unanswered prayer in a sense? Or not answering it the way that we devised. But it's a humble communication. Because sometimes we come and we don't even know how to pray. We don't even know how to ask. But His Spirit intercedes for us. That's what the Scripture says. His Spirit intercedes with us for, with groanings too deep for words. So Jude says, pray in the Holy Spirit, and part of the Holy Spirit's promised work is to make us aware of the gap between the way things are and the way things could be. So if I'm praying in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, as I've prayed, says, search me and try me, O God, and know my heart. He's working in my life, and He's showing me this gap between the way things are in my life and the way things should be in my life, and that's called conviction. And in that conviction, as the Spirit's working, He wants me to agree, confess, in order to bring what is and what should be together. Does that make sense? Are you all with me? Or do I need to start over? Okay? So that's an important thing. And so, you know... To bring that together, we've got to confess our sins. The Scripture says if we're faithful and just to confess our sins, that um, not if we're faithful and just, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the writer of the Hebrews says then, let us then with confidence draw near the throne of grace. Wow, think about this. You know, if I showed up in Washington and went to the White House, I'm not going to get into the Oval Office. If I show up in Tallahassee and go to Governor Rick Scott's office, you think they're going to let me in? I mean, I don't even think I could get in the mayor's office here in Destin. 
But the creator and the sustainer and the authority and the, the God, the one who loves us and who sent his son, says, I can draw boldly to the throne of grace. You know, it, it's kind of illustrated like this. I, 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 come in, I come in here, you know, and, and I'm seeking God and, and say, that's the throne of grace up there. And I'm able to, to draw boldly. I'm, I'm able to come. I'm able to ascend the stairway. I'm able to stand in the presence of Almighty God Himself. I may ascend the throne of grace. Let us draw near, the Scripture says, that we may receive mercy and that we may find grace to help in our time of need. You know, John Calvin, the church reformer, he said, Such is the coldness of our makeup that none of us can succeed in praying as we ought to without the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we go to lunch today, most of us are going to say a blessing, right? If you're going to say a blessing, lift your hand. Okay, so you said a blessing. God is good. God, God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. Or if you're a hungry Baptist, you're going to say, good food, good meat, good Lord, let's eat. Right? But what you're doing is you're saying the prayer, but you're not praying in the power of God's Spirit. Does that make sense? You're not praying in the power of His Spirit. So we need that prompting of God's Spirit within us to close the gaps, to draw us to the throne, to experience the reality of His mercy and grace. So we're looking where? In? Forward. Okay, for anticipation, you got to look forward. And Jude 21 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So we're to keep ourselves in the love of God. It's a basic attitude um, uh, that God has towards us. He's a God of love, and we're to keep ourselves in love with that same uh, kind of passion, that same kind of love as if we were first saved. Jesus said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said the love of Christ controls us because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but live for him who for their sake died and was raised. You know, you know I'm not living for myself. When Christ came into my heart, when I said, Lord, I want my life to be built upon the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, as I began to, to, to continue to look in and, and put the word of God about my life as the, as the framework, when I, when I began to look up in prayer and, and began to pray in the Holy Spirit of God, I want to, to live my life in such a way so as to keep myself in that love of God. As Paul said, uh, that Christ may dwell in my hearts through faith, that I might be rooted and grounded in love that I might then have the strength to comprehend with all the saints. Man, I can't comprehend it all. I don't know why Christ loves me. I don't know why He loves you. I don't know why when He was on the cross, He didn't simply call a couple of thousand angels, 10,000 angels, or for that matter, one angel to come and destroy the world and set Him free. Why would He not do that? Because he loves us. He sees something in us that's of value. He sees something in us that's of worth. He sees something in us that's created together in the image of his glory. And he loves us. And he wants us in turn to love him back. And if my life is built upon that cornerstone, I am going to love him back. And then I'm to wait on the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you realize that Christianity, Christianity, this whole thing, us coming together on Sunday morning, oh yeah, we got here, we had some coffee, we had a cookie, uh, maybe had some punch. We've come in and we sang a couple of songs and, and, and Buddy and, and Carrie have lifted us up as they've sung. The pastor told a couple of really good jokes. Don't forget, this is Matt's fifth anniversary today. 
here at Village. Y'all be sure and tell him, tell Grace congratulations. Um, but Christianity itself, it only makes sense if God keeps his promises. Have you ever thought about that? Think about that a second. I, I know I, I'm probably going a little long today. I had it in my mind I was going to be done in 27 to 29 minutes. But I think it's important that we get this. Christianity, our faith, only makes sense if God keeps his promise. In the Old Testament, God gave promises. And in the Old Testament, their response was to be patient and faithful and wait. There are some that didn't. Micah, in the Old Testament, saw those around him as they deserted God's covenant. And he penned these words, But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God, to hear me. The New Testament opens with that hope being kept alive as Zechariah led temple worshipers in prayer for Messiah to come. And when the baby Jesus was brought to the temple for the very first time, Simeon recognized him. And he said, we've been waiting, we've been waiting for you. We've been waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was recognized. And, and then there was Anna, and, and, and Anna stood and she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward. They were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. And once the Lord Jesus Christ died and, and he rose from the grave and he was out there on that hillside, out on the Mount of Olives, and, and those disciples were looking on as he began to arise, as he began to go up, as he began to reach the clouds, and those clouds enveloped him. These disciples understood something on, as Jesus went back to heaven. That according to Luke 12, they would be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and when he knocks. They recognize that this same Jesus who's been taken up from them will be the same Jesus who returns. And that same Jesus who was took, taken up from them will be the same Jesus who returns to call us. One day... There will be a rumbling in the heavens. It will be the shout of the archangel. There will be the trumpet blast. And I believe that the sky is going to crack wide open from the east moving to the west. It's going to be opposite anything we've ever seen. And we are going to behold him. We're going to be, behold Him in all of His splendor. We're going to behold Him in all of His majesty. This time, He's not coming as a lamb. He's not coming as a baby to a manger. But He's coming as the warrior king. The king of kings and the Lord of lords, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And we're to look forward. We're to look forward to this appearing I love the way Paul puts it when he writes to the Romans. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth unto now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now a hope that is not seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he sees? And even the Spirit groans. Verse 26, the, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not, do not know how to pray as we ought to. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. We, in creation, and God Himself, groan. For the fulfillment of the promise. Groaning for the fulfillment of the promise. Now, what's this like? It's like watching Georgia and Oklahoma. 
And man, you're, you're sitting there. And, and, and you're groaning. You want to see your team win so bad. You're groaning. Or like Alabama and Clemson. Although your groaning didn't have to be that deep. But creation itself. And I groan for that day when, when this earthly tent shall be put aside. I was talking to my buddy the other day. He's my, well, probably, probably my best friend in ministry. Serves a church in another city. We usually talk at least once a week, probably 45 minutes or so. Him and I are so different. So different. I mean, he's the guy that he wears the coat and the tie and the vest and to sleep in. And, you know, he remembers everybody's name. And so I texted him over Christmas. I, I know you've been busy. I'm busy. Christmas is crazy. We'll talk after the new year. And so I called him the other day. And, and I, I started off, I said, what are you doing, man? You laying on a, on a sandy beach in the sun down in the Caribbean somewhere? He said, no, I'm not. He said, uh, I've got something I've got to tell you. I've got to resign my church. I said, what's going on? He said, I just got diagnosed uh, right before Christmas with a terminal illness. And the doctors and the specialists are saying that by the time they've caught this disease, it's so far advanced that I probably only have a couple months left to live. You know, I'm a guy that believes in a God who still heals. But I'm also that guy that's got that groaning to be reunited with God in that kind of a way where, where sickness and death and heartache and sorrow and brokenness will never, ever again invade the hearts and the lives of God's people. I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to that day when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised day land. What a day, what a glorious day that will be. And friend, and family, and church, if your life has not been built upon the only foundation, the only stone of Christ Jesus, Today's the day. You don't know what tomorrow holds. If you need spiritual revitalization so as to experience God fresh and new, this is the moment to start. It's not Wednesday when we start the study. It's right now in making the decision. Oh, Lord, search me and try me and test my heart and know what the wicked ways are. God, I want to get back on the same page as you, Lord, I want to see that gap closed up to where we're no longer two, but we're one. Lord, I want to look in. I want to look up. And I want to look forward. Will you come this morning as we sing? Let's pray. Father, you're a good, good father. And we're blessed by you over and over and over. Lord, would you in the fire and the power of your Holy Spirit rest upon us right now and do mighty things that only you can do. Father, to you be the glory and the honor and the praise in the precious name in the only name, in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.